we're going to have something a little different and something that I hope is not as complicated as um, the talk you just heard. I'm going to talk to you about GMOs, and in particular I'm going to tell you a little something about the background, how I got involved in this. I'm not a plant scientist, I work with bacteria. Uh, I'll tell you the consequences and where we stand at the moment. And I know for quite a lot of you, about a little over a year ago, we, I started a campaign involving Nobel laureates because I was very disappointed in what was happening in the GMO debate. And basically, we wrote a letter that was sent to Greenpeace, it was sent to some other Green parties, it was sent to the ambassadors of the United Nations, of every nation on Earth, and it was asking them to stop scaring the public by pretending that GMO foods must be banned because they're dangerous. 124 Nobel laureates signed the petition that I put together, and the cartoon on the right really illustrates a major point here. On the left of that cartoon, you can see a rather ogre figure who is telling the child, do you know what this stuff can do to you and the idea that this will scare the child. And the child on the right who is starving in Africa or some other developing part of the world says, yes, it can keep me alive. And I think this illustrates well something that will be a recurring theme during the course of this talk and is a recurring theme during our campaign. And it is something that the Nobel laureates feel rather strongly about. Okay. I got involved in this because I went to the 80th birthday party of Mark Van Montague, the gentleman on the right-hand side of this slide. And he and Jeff Schell were the discoverers of something called TI plasmid transformation, in which they discovered that there was a bacterium that was able to transfer genes from the bacterium into a plant. And Mark and Jeff, together with Mary Del Chilton, who independently worked in this same area, discovered that here was a way in which one could take genes that were not normally in a plant and take them from a bacteria into a plant. And this was really a, an amazing discovery because all of a sudden it meant that one was going to be able to do precision breeding of plants in ways that had never previously been possible. Now I sat for a day listening to these plant biologists talking about this and almost every single one of them mentioned the fact that during the course of this work that they had been handed by the anti-GMO people, by Greenpeace, to a point where many of them um, had gotten out of the field or partially gotten out of the field and started doing other things because they couldn't get the funding they needed to do the work or in some cases had been silenced altogether. They used to go out and speak in public about this issue and they stopped because of the anti-GMO movement. And Greenpeace were particularly vocal in this area. Now the day after this symposium, I had been scheduled to go and talk to the European Commission about the future of medicine. Not that I know a great deal about that, but there were some things that I thought I could say that would be useful. But I decided that I was going to change uh, my mind because in fact, the European Commission are the people who had been anti-GMO to a large extent themselves. And I thought I would talk to them, not about medicine per se, but rather about agriculture. If you think about the kind of medicine that is needed in the developed world, people who have lots of money, people like cutting edge solutions. They get cancer, they want the very latest cancer treatments. And for them, in the US, in Japan, in Europe, the high cost of such treatment really isn't much of a problem. But if you go to the developing countries, 
all of a sudden money becomes very important, and what are needed are practical solutions to the problems they have, and costs must be kept low. And if you don't have very much money, and you live in a developing country, probably the most important thing to you is food. There are some 800 million people who go to, head to bed hungry every night. They, they don't care so much about medicine, they care about food. And it's really important that we do something about this. Now food means agriculture. And agriculture was developed some 10 to 12,000 years ago in the Middle East, in what was then Mesopotamia, where the hunter-gatherers realized that by taking some of the plants that they were going out into the forest to find, they could plant them in their backyard and they could slowly grow crops and didn't need to go looking for these plants anymore. And what happened over time was that they got better and better at picking good plants, good healthy plants, and then they learned to cross them. And they learned that they could actually breed these plants and make substantial changes in the plants by genetic modification of all things until they could produce the plants that we eat today. Now I'd like to show this slide because this is a very good illustration of what has been done by so-called natural plant breeding. On the very left is a tiny thin little strip that is actually the precursor for the modern day corn cob, which you see on the extreme right. Um, in the US we call it corn, in many, most parts of the world they call it maize. And this was done by just simple breeding practices, first in Central America and then slowly spread around to other areas. And a lot of breeding went on and a certain amount of change was taking place. That is, the corn was being genetically modified along the way. Now, the conventional way of doing this, conventional breeding, is that we take two plants, one of which is the one that we're growing at the moment, that we call the elite variety, it's the one that we really like, and another one that perhaps has some desired property. So in the, in the case of corn, maybe you want something that will stand straight up and not bend over when the corn cob forms. And you can go out into the wild and very often you can find a natural variety that will stick straight up. And then you try to make a cross between these two and then select for the one that has picked up the genes that you care about. This is shown on the right hand side, the, oh, in the middle actually, is where you've made the first cross and half of the genes have come from one plant and half have come from the other in much the way that when we make a baby, the genes come half from the father, half from the mother. Now, of course, when you do this, you get a massive mixture of genes, only one or two of which may be the ones that you really want. And so then you take the hybrids that have the desired property and you cross them back to the original elite variety until you slowly get rid of the genes that you don't want and you save those hybrids that have the gene you do want. Now, of course, you don't get rid of all of the genes that you don't want, but, but you get rid of most of them. This is the conventional breeding that is widely considered to be perfectly safe. Now, with conventional breeding, you don't always get what you want. And so what the plant breeders have done they discovered that they could make mutants of these plants by irradiating them, by putting toxic chemicals on them, and you could make changes in the genes and that occasionally this would give you the trait that you wanted. This again is considered perfectly safe, it's natural breeding. Now what Mark and Jeff came up with, I'll get this right before I'm finished, was something that I like to think of as precision breeding. So this gene that they wanted to get from a wild type plant that was living at, in the jungle somewhere, they could isolate that gene and instead of crossing it into the plant, they could clone the gene into a bacterium, actually into this TI plasma. And you could then take that bacterium and use it to transfer the gene into the plant. 
And it turns out this is actually a perfectly natural process. What we've been discovering over the last few years is that as we've been sequencing the genes from various plants, we discover there are actually a lot of bacterial genes that have typically gotten into plants. We don't always know how they got there, but nevertheless, they're easily identifiable. Now, this approach really follows a natural process, um, but it's one in which we can interfere with using recombinant DNA techniques. If we compare conventional breeding on the left in which we make many crosses, use mutagenesis if we have to, with what I call precision breeding on the right, in which we just take the gene we want, or two genes, or three, and put it into the plant that we want in order to get the hybrid that we want. And if you go and talk to the anti-GMO people, to Greenpeace, the Green Parties, and so on, who want to scare you with this, they will tell you that everything went, that went on on the left, in which you take hundreds of genes and move them about, this is perfectly safe. But on the right, where we take one gene, I know exactly what it is, and I put it into a plant, this is dangerous. And this is the basis of the scare stories that have been put out over the course of time by the Green Party. I want to give you an analogy because I find that this is very useful. There are many people who don't understand the genetics quite so well. And so instead of thinking about a gene, let's think about a GPS system. I want to take a GPS system from one car and I want to put it in the other. Do I take the two cars apart, take all the parts, mix them back up together, and then select the one with the GPS? Well, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Why don't I just take the GPS system from one car and put it in the other one? And that is what precision reading is all about. We take one gene that we want and we put it where we would like it to go. Now, the green parties would have you believe that if I had taken this GPS, not from a car, but from an airplane, then now the, air, the new car is going to fly. So the anti-GMO people have been spreading these stories. Well, if I take something from a salmon, then all of a sudden the plant is going to swim, or whatever else we want to think about. The problem has been that the green parties have been incredibly successful at scaring people. And I think we all know how easy it is to get scared. We've all watched horror movies when we were kids. And it doesn't take very much to get people scared. And once you're scared, the difficult thing is how do you then reassure people that it's actually all okay? And the Green Parties have done a wonderful job of scaring people. And those of us who try to remove the scare and to tell you that it's really okay, um, do not in general have the tools available or the funding available to us in order to tell the story well. And really what is important here is the product. It's not how I got to that product that is important. It's the product. Is it safe? Is it not safe? GMO is, is just a method. And so because something was made using GMO techniques tells you absolutely nothing about whether the final product is safe or not. Let's take another analogy here that I like. This is a production line. And this line is making some form of transportation. Now, is that an inherently dangerous thing or is it inherently safe? Well, if you look at the two possible products that I outline here, one is a car, which is relatively safe, and the other is a tank. Um, they obviously have very different kinds of properties at the end. And so one should not judge the method by which these things were made. You have to judge the final product. Now, one of the things you have to realize is that plants have a problem. When someone wants to come along and eat them, a beetle, whatever, caterpillar, they can't run away. And they have to protect themselves. And so how do they do this? Well, it turns out that they make pesticides. They make all sorts of compounds that will kill beetles, will kill caterpillars, will kill things that try to eat them. 
A good example is shown here. Um, an awful lot of the things that we eat, that we are quite happy with, turn out to have very high levels, in some cases, of pesticides, but in most cases, they're pretty low levels. I just would draw your attention to the one on lines three, four, and five, and that is celery. I think we pretty much all eat celery, we never give it a second thought. However, if you were working on a farm and you're harvesting celery, and you're cutting the stalks, you tend to get the juice on your hands. Or if you work in a supermarket and you're chopping up the celery to put into the nice packets that we sell, you tend to get the juice on your hands. People who do that end up with a dermatitis. If it's particularly bad, it can end up as a skin cancer. And the reason for that is because within the celery, there are some quite potent carcinogens. In this case, the carcinogen is called sarlin, and if you get a lot of it on your hands, uh, you can be in trouble. Now, the amounts that are actually present in celery when you eat it are sufficiently low that your body can deal with it without a problem. No one has been reported to get cancer as a result of eating celery. But if you get a lot of the juice on your hands, from days after day after day of cutting it, then you can have a problem. There are quite a lot of vegetables that are shown on the right-hand slide here. Um, things like parsnips, things like Brussels sprouts, and so on, that produce these would-be carcinogens. These are just pesticides that these plants use to protect themselves from parasites. However, the Green Parties would have you believe that if we deliberately put some of these compounds into a plant, some that the plants normally use all for themselves, that this is inherently very dangerous. Scientifically, it does not make a lot of sense. So, what is the matter with GMOs? Why is it that there has been this antipathy towards GMOs? And as was mentioned in the introduction, the Europeans don't need GMOs. They never needed GMOs. And the reason is that in the developed world, the agricultural companies and the plant breeders have spent enormous amounts of money improving the crops so that they could sell them to the population. A lot of money has been spent on this. A lot of effort has been put into it, but principally into just a few crops which are the ones that we tend to eat in the West. Now, since you don't really need these things, but in other countries you do, if you go into Africa, you discover they, they don't like corn so much, and they, they don't eat a huge amount of potatoes, but they like cassava, uh, and they like other crops that we don't normally think of in the West. And these have never been subject to the kind of breeding, intensive breeding, to make better varieties that produce better yields, perhaps will grow faster, will grow taller, will make it easier to harvest. They've never been done. Nothing has ever been done to that because the agricultural companies couldn't make money from it. And so when Monsanto first started to develop plants using these new so-called GMO methods, the precision breeding methods, they made a mistake. And their mistake was to think that, well, people would just accept these and it wasn't going to be a problem. And so they started to introduce them in the US and then into Europe. But Europe had a massive reaction to it. And why was this? Why is it that they got so mad? Well, could it be politics? Could it be money? Or could it be both? And I will tell you it was actually both. So what happened was that the Europeans didn't want US companies to control their food. How do you prevent that? Well, of course, you could ban Monsanto and the other big US agribusinesses. But there's a small problem there, is that these big agribusinesses were actually providing the seeds that the European farmers were growing. And so if you banned Monsanto, then you really would have a problem with food in Europe, because they wouldn't have any food. And so this turned out to be a bit of a problem. So how do you solve this? Well, you assert that this precision agriculture, these new GMO methods, might be dangerous. 
And in the usual, the oldest political game in the world, the politicians said, aha, but we will save you from this. We will ban GMOs, and then you won't have to worry about it. Well, that was quite okay, that worked all right, and the best of it was, it had no economic consequences whatsoever for Europe. Europe was not going to gain from the use of GMOs. It turned out the way that Monsanto went about selling it was they were going to make a lot of money, the farmers were going to make a little bit of money, and the consumers were actually expected to pay a little more for these products. Just, just foolish in retrospect. This was not the way to introduce something new. But the problem has been that you cannot say these things are dangerous for Europeans but they're perfectly okay in Africa or they're perfectly okay in the developing world. And so what's happening is that the NGOs like Greenpeace, the Green Parties and so on have now gone around into the developing countries and they're telling the people there that these things are dangerous, that GMOs are dangerous and these are the people who really need them. They also had this wonderful pesticide myth that the Green Parties were putting out and that is that pesticide use um, was bound to go up if you started to grow plants in which you'd artificially put in pesticide genes. How that came about, I don't know. But in fact, if you look in 2001, before GM products became available in India, um, pesticide use was getting up towards 6,000 tons a year, and the yield was about 308 kilograms. This was for BT cotton. In 2013, when almost all the Indian farmers were now growing BT cotton, pesticide use went down to 200 metric tons and the yield almost doubled. And so here was a perfect example where a GMO had taken a naturally occurring pesticide, BT, is a toxin that is produced by Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a bacterium, it lives in the soil, it's everywhere. In fact, it's the one that the organic farmers use to spray all their plants with. Um, they think it's fine if you spray the plants with this BT toxin, it's perfectly okay, but put the gene in the plant so that it can make it itself, and all of a sudden, that's very dangerous. So, pesticide use will go down, does go down, and in the process, yields can increase. Now, when we look and ask, well, what has been the scientific community's response to this? Well, it turns out that every major scientific society and scientific academy in the world has all said that there is nothing that one should need to worry about with foods, with crops made using the GM method. The only people who have raised problems have been a couple of institutes that I name here on the right, which are basically collections of anti-GMO people who have formed little academies so that they can pretend that they're showing good scientific credentials. This list on the left, there are some 250 academies and societies that have now come out and said the method is basically a good one. Now I want to give you a case study of how this is so important in the developing world. And this concerns vitamin A deficiency. You know, if you grow up in a country where you don't have good access to the precursor for vitamin A, um, which is beta carotene, um, which we all get by eating carrots, by eating other, other um, crops that have plenty of beta carotene in them. But if you live on rice, for instance, as the main staple, and I, I noticed that that's quite common here, that when you grow up, in a, a poverty-ridden ridden country where you do not have access to beta-carotene, it turns out that vitamin A deficiency is a major problem. And it does two really serious things. One is it affects the development of the eyes, and so children can very easily go, go blind if they don't get enough. But it also affects development, and so the kids don't develop as well as they might. And somewhere between 1, 1.9 to 2.7, kids, almost all kids, die every year just because they don't get enough vitamin A. Compare that with HIV, with tuberculosis, with malaria, the numbers are quite alarming. And this is just because they have a, a poor nutritious diet. 
Now, a couple of scientists, one in Switzerland, Ingo Petrikas, and one in Germany, Peter Bayer, decided that they would do something about this. They thought that because so many of the people who were being affected by this have rice as their staple product, that they would take the genes for beta carotene and put them into rice and produce a variety of rice that would provide a sufficient amount of beta carotene so that they could cure vitamin A deficiency. And the hope was that they would then save a lot of lives. This became a reality in 1999. That's 18 years ago for those not very good at math. This was in the hands of the breeders at that time and could have been spread. If it had not been a GMO, within two, three, four, five years, it would have been out in the fields and people would have been growing it anyway. But it's a GMO, and if we're lucky, it may be available by the end of 2017. The first trials have just finished successfully in Bangladesh. Um, it is now starting to be grown in the Philippines, we hope, um, and soon will be spread around. And the years of delay were all caused by the Green parties being actively opposed to it at every possible step. They made governments introduce regulations so that they couldn't grow it. When they got permission to grow it in the fields, they sent activists out to go and burn down these crops. It's just appalling what went on. And you listen now to the Green parties and they'll say, oh yes, you tell us all about golden rice, but where is it? We've not seen it. Tell us where it is. And they, of course, are the ones who've been blocking it. So since 2002, as many as 15 million children have died or suffered because of vitamin A deficiency. My question to the Green parties is, is, how many must die before we consider this a crime against humanity? If this was a, a, a bunch of tribes in Africa who were go going off killing kids, there would have been a global uproar about this. But how much have you heard? Very little, because the Green Parties have been against it. Now, there are many ways in which GMO methods can actually prove incredibly valuable. And I want to mention one, which is what I call the banana problem. So, in Uganda and in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, bananas are a major source of calories. In Uganda, 30% of all of the calories that the population consumes come from bananas. And a few years ago, a disease started called banana wilt disease. It's caused by a bacterium, Xanthomonas, and there is no natural solution to stop Xanthomonas from growing. There are something like a few hundred varieties of banana. They're all kept on a seed stock in Belgium. Every single one has been tested, and none of them are resistant to this particular bacterium. However, if you look at sweet peppers, they too could suffer from this disease, but they have two genes in them that will stop it. And if you put those two genes into bananas, you stop it in bananas. So here's a case where a major food supply for Sub-Saharan Africa is being threatened by a disease for which there is no possibility of a traditional breeding method to stop it. The only way you can stop it is by spraying vast amounts of pesticides onto the bananas. And that turns out to be very difficult to do. And so what's happened is a lot of the bananas, who, uh, the farmers who get infected with this disease either go out of business or they go and they find something else to do. There's another big threat that's coming up in Africa called the four army worm. This is now in Zimbabwe in a major way. It's really spreading very rapidly. It kills maize. The caterpillars get into the corn cobs and they just eat it all up. There is a beautiful GM solution for this. Four army worm was something that used to affect the US. Um, they put the BT gene into maize and that stops the fall army worm. However, they're not allowed to import those plants into most of Africa because the Green Parties have successfully convinced the leaders of these African countries that they're dangerous and that they shouldn't be grown, even though they've been growing for years in the US. In Bangladesh, 
There is a great success story. So they were having a lot of problems with eggplant. A GM eggplant in which the BT gene, this same Bacillus thuringiensis gene, was put into eggplants. And that is now growing and being consumed in Bangladesh. And the farmers are very happy because the yields have increased. And they don't need to use pesticides or not as many pesticides. In Hawaii, there's a major problem with papayas. The papayas were being devastated by a ring spot virus. Scientists at the University of Hawaii made a GM variety of the papaya plant, and that stopped the disease. And now something like 70% of all of the papayas that are grown in Hawaii are actually GM papayas. And they're sold in the US and they're sold elsewhere. And they're perfectly safe. People have been eating these. that have never been a problem. Well, that's just the same thing. In Thailand, they have the same problem. So in Thailand, they too have this same ring spot virus, but the type of papayas they grow there is a little bit different from the one in Hawaii. And so the local people there have actually made GM papayas. And even though you are not allowed to grow GM crops in Thailand, the farmers are doing it anyway, because otherwise they'd be out of business. Farmers are actually rather sensible. Now, what we have to remember is that food choice is really a luxury of the developing world. Okay, if you don't want to eat GM crops, then don't. But don't pretend they're dangerous. Be honest about the reason that you don't want to do it. And if anything, they're probably safer than any of the traditional foods that we eat. Almost all of the crops that we have out there were made by traditional methods. We don't know what genes are in them. We don't know what's been going on, uh, but we've been eating them and we found out the hard way if something was not very suitable and people would die from eating it. Uh, and that apparently is a perfectly safe way of doing things. You might also think that the organic farmers um, would convince you that you should buy organic. Well, in fact, if you want to get a bacterial foodborne disease, eat as much organic food as you can because the rates of infections are 10 times higher than with the regular foods that we buy in the supermarket. And uh, when you think of how they grow these things, it is not too surprising. So for developed countries, food is simply not a problem. We have more than enough. We go to Europe, we don't see a lot of thin Europeans unless they just immigrated from Africa and are looking for a, a better life. But when we make statements about foods or about anything, we should not forget the consequences for the developing countries. And one of the things we do is we need much more science in politics. We need the politicians to listen to the scientists. And while we're about it, it would be good if there was a little less politics in science. I think politicians should listen to the science they fund. If they don't want to listen to the scientists, why do they fund us in the first place? doesn't make a lot of sense. At the bottom here, there's an EU report that is being set up at the moment, which urges that the G8 member states should not support GM crops in Africa. This is a, a codicil that's been put in by the anti-GMO people. So they want the Europeans to stop helping the developing countries from developing the very GM crops that they're going to need if they're going to survive. And I think civil society also needs to play a role here. For instance, the major religious leaders should speak out. I met with the Pope just before Christmas, and we're trying to convince the Pope to make a positive statement. There has been one positive statement that has come out not too long ago, uh, and this concerned the bread that you eat in the sacrament called transubstantiation. The bread that you eat when you take Mass cannot have gluten-free bread. It must not be gluten-free, but if it's GMO, it's okay. That's, that's the most positive statement yet that's come out of, the, out of the Vatican. But I've spoken to Buddhists, I spoke to Buddhist leaders last year, and they're perfectly happy with all of this, but they, they won't speak out, they won't speak to their congregations about it, and they should. The Rotary Clubs can be very influential too. They have a big gathering, um, they, there's no reason why they could not be pro-GMOs. Celebrities, media, 
knowledgeable scientists, we need to get out and talk about this stuff and let people know that this is all okay. And my last slide, I say, have a heart. Let's recognize that non-GMO is a Western indulgence. This little boy on the left has no trouble finding food in his local market. But the little boys on the right have a great deal of trouble finding the food they need. Um, we need to help them. If you look at the website at the bottom there, support precision agriculture, the ORG. This is a website that has been put together by the Nobel laureates. It contains a lot of information about GMOs, and it offers you the opportunity to join us and sign up and add your name to the list of people who will support GMOs. And most of all, go and talk to your friends. If anybody wants copies of these slides, I make them available to anybody who wants them. And there are video recordings of some talks that I've given in this area. Those two are available. And there is a, a film that has just been made, a very good pro-GMO film. It's called Food Evolution. And that too will be available in local cinemas before too long. So thank you all for your attention. And I hope I convinced you. Love GMOs.